Thank you all. Please be seated. This is a time set for oral argument in our case number CACB 220283 Yam Capital v. Joe Bailey. Um, good morning, counsel. Uh, each side is allocated 20 minutes for argument. Appellant may reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal. If you wish to do so, you need to keep track of uh, your time at the podium clock. Out of respect for counsel and to avoid embarrassment, I would ask that folks in attendance make sure their cell phones are off. Um, we've read the briefs. We've conferenced the case. We're familiar with the record. We'd encourage you to keep that in mind um, as you present oral argument today. Our proceedings are being... Uh, uh, recorded and will be posted to YouTube in due course. So please, as you begin your argument, start by telling us your name and the party that you represent. With that, Mr. Walker, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Richard Walker. I appear today on behalf of the appellants, defendants, uh, Dr. Joe S. and Annette L. Bailey. Uh, this is a case, as the court is well aware, uh, in which YAM uh, seeks to collect on the basis of personal guarantees signed by the Baileys, both Arkansas uh, citizens and domiciliaries, um, that, and they were required to sign this in connection with the 2017 loan that YAM was planning to uh, make to GS Hospitality, uh, which I will refer to as GSH using as security a hotel property uh, situated in Hollister, Missouri, that was GSH's sole assets. Uh, the disposition of this case at the trial court level uh, suffers from three major areas of infirmity. Uh, first and foremost, um, the facts of this case do not admit of the assertion of in personam jurisdiction over the Baileys. Um, under uh, any of the theories that have been advanced by YAM. Second, there are serious defects in the trial court's rulings on YAM's motion for summary judgment as later modified by YAM's uh, so-called motion for clarification uh, by which it persuaded the court essentially to uh, change its original denial of uh, the motion for summary judgment into a grant of summary judgment on all issues save the, the question of the fair market value of the collateral. And third, there are equally serious flaws in uh, some evidentiary and legal rulings uh, that occurred in connection with the fair market value hearing uh, that have so uh, seriously tainted that proceeding uh, as uh, uh, to require it to be uh, uh, disregarded. In fact, as explained in our reply brief at page 17, the trial court's judgment, if allowed to stand, places Yam in the position of being able to reap a total of $14,078,028 plus interest accruing at 24% per annum from a loan in the principal amount of $7.7 .7 million. That's a profit, again, without regard to the interest, of 82.83%. Uh, clearly a windfall by any standard. Okay, well, so let's start with the beginning, which is where we have to start. We have a forum selection clause. And forum selection clauses aren't something that are unusual or certainly disfavored. Um, so why does this forum selection clause not establish the personal jurisdiction over which you're complaining? Uh, the the Supreme, United States Supreme Court's decision in the Burger King case uh, made it clear that form selection clauses are enforceable under uh, the due process clause of the United States Constitution only if they have been freely negotiated um, and they are reasonable and just. This so form selection. With, go ahead. Which what do you what what do you say um, undermines this one? Uh, two things. First of all, uh, as uh, the Baileys put forth in response to the motion for summary judgment and in their motion to dismiss, uh, the, this was not a freely negotiated guarantee. Uh, it was drafted by YAM um, and presented for signature uh, with direction that there was no point in the Baileys proposing any uh, revisions to uh, YAM's draft 
documents. Did they, did, I mean, people say that all the time in negotiating. Did they propose taking it out? Uh, no, Your Honor. I think the, 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 this happened in a fairly short period of time under exigent circumstances. Dr. Bailey was confronted with the possibility of the loss of his investment in GSH because of a disaster that had befallen the majority owner requiring him to sell his interest. And if that were sold to a third party, Dr. Bailey risked being wiped out. Um, and and uh, when uh, Dr. Bailey was told there's no point in proposing any revisions to language, um, he took Mr. Marmus, the YAM executive who told him that, at his word. Is it unusual to have this kind of provision in a guarantee? Um, it's, it, it is not unusual to have a forum selection clause, Your Honor. Uh, however, I would submit that this one is unusual in its one-sidedness and oppressiveness. It limits the Baileys, if they want to litigate against YAM or if YAM chooses to litigate in Arizona, to an Arizona forum, but reserves to YAM the, the uh, right to basically seek remedy in any jurisdiction of its choice. And in that sense, uh, I think the, the Forum Selection Clause fails to, miss, uh, fails to meet the second requirement of Burger King, which is that it be reasonable and just under the circumstances. Well, but those possibilities didn't happen. We are here in Arizona, right? I mean, you're talking about concerns about what might have happened that, that didn't happen. Um, Yam is, is present in Arizona. The suit is here in Arizona. Well, the suit is here in Arizona, Your Honor, but the Baileys, since the filing of their original answer and, and then their subsequent uh, amended answer, have objected to in personam jurisdiction. And, if, and, if, and, if, and I understand that, but I guess what I'm worried about, or con, con, wanting to know more about, I should say, as a follow-up to Vice Chief Judge Goss's question is why is this forum selection clause unenforceable? The fact that it was in a contract that was not amended, and a party to the other party said we're not going to amend it. That that isn't enough to show unenforceability. There are all sorts of contracts that exist like that that have forum selection clauses that are enforceable. Uh, Your Honor, I'd respectfully disagree, um, because because if as Burger King states. Um, Form selection clauses must be freely negotiated. That's the language of, of, the, the, of the Supreme Court. Are you saying then that the parties have to be able to make changes for a contract to be enforceable? I don't, I don't follow. Well, I think there, there are uh, a couple of possibilities. Number one, a party could, could freely agree and, and, and decide that they uh, were perfectly happy with the form selection clause. Second possibility is the party um, it, uh, the the non-drafting party uh, could say, you know, I'm not happy with this. I'd like to propose X, Y, and Z changes, and negotiations ensue, um, reaching some kind of result. Um, and then the third possibility is that the drafting party says, don't bother me with proposed uh, amendments to the language of our 120-some pages of documents, typewritten, single-spaced. Um, there, there aren't going to be any changes. And, and that cuts off and, and, by definition, makes the language of the agreement something other than freely negotiated, which the Supreme Court said is a sine qua non. So you would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so it's your position that a lengthy contract that might be required, say, by the Federal Trade Commission to read like it does without amendment, I'm not saying that's true here, but a lengthy contract where the other party says we're not going to make any changes, that's unenforceable. Just that. Yes. Um, it, because by definition, that is not a freely negotiated contract, which the Supreme Court said is the sine qua non for enforceability. I understand your position. Isn't, isn't the issue with freely negotiated that he had, these folks had the ability to say no? They could have walked away from this contract. They, no one forced their signature here. So I'm, I'm struggling with why you say this wasn't freely negotiated. Well, um, it was presented, um, and, and um, the, the Baileys were informed that there was no room for negotiation. Okay. Um, the, the, and under the circumstances, 
this was not something that the Baileys had months to consider. Um, they, were, they were under pressure because of the disaster that had befallen the majority owner, which threatened Dr. Bailey's um, uh, investment in GSH. So if, if, the, if Yam had come in and said, propose whatever amendments you want, that was all they had to do. Because under your analysis, as long as anyone comes in and says, propose whatever you want, sits back, takes all the amendments and says no. It's now been freely negotiated. So your only issue is Yam said up front what it could have said later under your analysis. Well, I think that raises a question of good faith. Um, and, and I think freely negotiated uh, uh, implies um, some good faith negotiation. Um, now, in, in your circumstances, if uh, uh, Yam had said, with respect to this form selection clause or any other clause in this incredibly one-sided uh, uh, guarantee, uh, if you want to propose uh, changes, let us know and we'll consider them. And there was no evidence that that was just a, a, a going through the motions kind of operation. So I can use it, the same argument against Microsoft because Microsoft never offered me to amend my Word per, my Microsoft Word contract. I, it seems that your argument would extend to every single com contract out there that the 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 person making the offer has to offer the opportunity to amend and in good faith then go through all the proposed amendments. Um, How does the world work that way? I, I, I think, Your Honor, the, um, the the Supreme Court's decision simply says freely negotiated okay. to be enforceable. And um, I, I, with respect to your Microsoft example, if your contract with Microsoft was not freely negotiated and you were um, advised that you wouldn't have the opportunity to present proposed amendments, um, then I think there is an issue with its enforceability. Counsel, you'd mentioned you, your second point, the summary judgment rulings. Let me encourage you to move to that in the interest of time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yes, the, the, what happened is uh, the trial court denied uh, Yam's motion for summary judgment. Uh, it made a, a, uh, the only real finding in the, in the uh, uh, court's decision was it rejected, we think, on improper grounds, uh, the Bailey's unconscionability contract of adhesion argument um, on the grounds that as a matter of law, those don't apply to commercial loans. Um, well, this is not an action on a commercial loan. It's an action on a guarantee in which private parties were asked to put their assets uh, on the line in order to facilitate a loan. Um, and uh, there's nothing in either logic or case law that would suggest that as a matter of law, the, the issues of unconscionability and uh, contract of adhesion do not apply in that context. But uh, the court ends up denying the motion for summary judgment, um, noting that the, the guarantee required waiver of uh, the Bailey's rights under ARS 33-814A, which this court and the Arizona Supreme Court several years before this transaction occurred had held were non-waivable. So in effect, you have Yam thumbing its nose at the decisions of, of the Arizona appellate courts about the waivability and saying, we don't care, you gotta waive this. Um, and that, and the, uh, uh, because the Baileys were uh, informed there was no room for negotiation, uh, the Bailey signed the, the guarantee with that language in it. The court noted that uh, it considered that to be applicable, 33-814A, uh, uh, to be applicable to the circumstances of this case. Uh, and it said, at least with respect to the, to the matter of the quantum of damages, um, there is an issue of fact to be resolved. Yam then comes along behind that and files a motion for, quote, clarification, in which it, in effect, asks the court to convert its denial of the motion for summary judgment into a grant of partial summary judgment on all issues other than uh, the fair market value issue. And the court, basically, without elucidating its reasons for doing so, did exactly that. 
So retroactively, the denial of, motion, of the motion for summary judgment is converted into a grant of a motion for partial summary judgment, foreclosing any further litigation on any of the um, uh, defenses or some of which, uh, with respect to some of which there were factual disputes, including the issue of jurisdiction. Um, and, and that we submit, your honors, it was improper. Uh, particularly with, when the court doesn't bother to uh, share its reasoning for um, uh, reversing course as it did. I'd like to spend doesn't, a couple of minutes. Doesn't a trial court always retain jurisdiction until entry of judgment to alter its intermediate rulings if it believes it has gotten it wrong? It does. Um, but it, in the context of a motion for summary judgment, uh, Rule 56 uh, states that the reasons for uh, granting the motion uh, should be uh, uh, um, articulated. And it uses should, not must or shall. It does. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, however, in this case, when, when you have issues, number one, um, there, there were evidentiary objections, very solid evidentiary objections, to the only evidence that EM offered in its motion for summary judgment as to the quantum of its damages. It basically said, here's a list of our damages, and here's a statement from one of our executives saying this is accurate. But, but the damages issue in either of the court's rulings, the court said was an issue of fact to be resolved later, right? The amount of damages, wasn't there a damages hearing? There, there was a hearing on fair market value as right. it affected damages. Right. But the court took as, as uh, established that the, the list of damages YAM had, had submitted with its motion for summary judgment without evidentiary support, um, that that had been uh, established as a factual matter in the case. It had not. And that ruling, at least according to case law, would assume that the objections to the evidence were overruled, right? The, the, uh, that's... Um, Yes, that I, that I think would be a fair assumption. And I interrupted you. I think you were you were off to uh, to talk about uh, that that hearing. But uh, well, first I wanted to talk to, about the issue of the the uh, application of uh, 33-814A, uh, which defines fair market value in pertinent part as the most probable price as of the date of execution sale for which the real property would sell after reasonable exposure in the market, and here's the critical language, under conditions requisite to fair sale with the buyer and seller, each acting prudently, knowledgeably, and for self-interest, assuming neither is under duress. Now, uh, this trustee sale took place on May 6, 2020. Both the experts for both sides testified that the, the, the conditions affecting the, the saleability of hospitality industry properties at that moment in time were the worst in recorded history. That the impact of the, the advent of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, created, um, created a cumul an impact greater than the cumulative impact of both the Great Recession and the 9-11 attacks. The uh, Bailey's expert testified without contradiction that the, the conditions that existed on May 6, 2020 were only conditions for liquidation sales, not fair sale. And as such, the definition of fair market value uh, could not be met and the, and the determination of the value of the collateral as of that date uh, could, could not be, uh, was an impossibility. Uh, he also testified, again without contradiction, that the conditions requisite to fair sale were not restored until the fall of 2020, which I think is consistent with most of our uh, individual experiences. But didn't, but didn't the court have conflicting expert opinions um, about whether or not a fair sale was possible? And don't we have to defer to the findings of the Superior Court as to those facts and credibility in which they weighed more? Why would we go back in and make a different determination that your expert was more credible when there are findings? Well, Your Honor, we're not asking the court to make a, make a credibility determination as between the two experts. Um, the, the point is... Are you sure? 
Um, but I'm fairly confident, Your Honor. Well, I mean, you're asking us to say that they made that the court made a wrong determination because the conditions for a fair sale weren't there when it looked to me from the record that the experts were in disagreement about whether that was possible. They were not in, in disagreement about the impact of the uh, advent of the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, pandemic um, and that that produced a true calamity in this market, something that um, we should hope none of us ever see again. Um, and uh, I think by implication, I don't recall that Mr. McCoy, Yam's expert, uh, ever explicitly stated that he believed the conditions for fair sale existed on May 6, 2020. He did render an opinion on value. So I suppose by implication, um, um, either he was disregarding uh, the definition for fair market value in the statute, um, and he did testify that he was not familiar with Arizona law, or um, uh, he was uh, implicitly making a determination uh, that the conditions requisite to fair sale were um, in, in existence on that date. Um, Your Honor, I see I've <laughs> exhausted my time. I really wish to reserve a couple minutes for rebuttal. and. With with uh, leave and my panel mates, we'll give you two minutes for uh, for rebuttal. But time goes fast. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Curry. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Jason Curry on behalf of Appley Yam Capital Three LLC. This is a deficiency case arising out of a typical Arizona commercial guarantee. The Maricopa County Commercial Court deals with these types of guarantees and these types of issues on a routine basis. Despite the guarantor's attempt to make, uh, to make it appear that there are complex legal and factual issues here, the, the Commercial Court rightly focused on the material facts and the genuine legal disputes and ultimately held the guarantors to their express, written, signed, and initial promises in this case under the guarantee. Today, Yam asked this court to do the same and to affirm that ruling. I'll start today by addressing uh, a couple issues. One is the form selection clause, which was discussed. Um, two is the summary judgment motion uh, issues. And then time permitting, I can address some of the remaining issues in the brief um, and some of the comments made by, by counsel. The first point is the personal jurisdiction. As you know, we had two alternative independent bases for personal jurisdiction. One was a forum selection clause, one was specific jurisdiction. I'll focus on the forum selection clause uh, for now because that is determinative. If the court finds it's an enforceable forum selection clause, there is no minimum contacts or specific jurisdiction analysis that needs to be done here. Also note at a, out, that out front that this was not developed. The challenge to the forum selection clause was never developed in their opening brief. We briefed the forum selection clause based on what was discussed at the trial court level, but in their opening brief, they mentioned the forum selection clause one time in their opening brief, and that's on pages 38 and 39, and really there was no discussion of the case law. There was no discussion regarding um, uh, development of the argument or citation to actual forum selection clause. In fact, they did not cite to a single, not one forum selection clause. They say Burger King is a forum selection clause case. It is not. Burger King did not have a forum selection clause involved in it. It was based on the Florida long arm statute. And that's how the court came to find that there was personal jurisdiction in Burger King. Burger King did cite to the 1979 Supreme Court case that mentioned forum selection clause in a footnote and in fact, Burger King cited that for the proposition that its ruling was not impacting forum selection clauses because that is a different issue and that's addressed under a uh, different analysis. So our position is, is that they have not fully developed this and the court need not consider any challenge to the forum selection clause. However, I will address the forum selection clause on its merits. Yam had the initial burden to show personal jurisdiction Yam did that through the complaint and did it through the summary judgment motion. Once that is the prima facie case is met, 
then the burden shifts to the defendant to show that there is not personal jurisdiction. And when you challenge a forum selection clause, it's a different burden. It's a heavy burden. The case law, under Arizona case law, the appellant has a heavy burden to show that a forum selection clause is unenforceable. The appellant here did not meet that. Another important note, note about burdens, in the context of personal jurisdiction, if there's conflicts in the affidavits about what happened in the past, those conflicts have to be resolved in favor of jurisdiction. So there were conflicts in this, right? There was the conflict, they say that Mike Marmis, Yam's um, executives, told them there's no reason to negotiate. But we have an email from Laura Petruno, the general counsel who actually negotiated documents, sent to their counsel saying, give us any comments you have to these loan documents. We also have Mike Marmis's declaration where he said he did not tell anyone he would not negotiate these loan documents. In fact, they were negotiated. Several of those, one of those loan documents, they asked for a change, which was made. They never asked for a change on the forum selection clause. With respect to freely negotiate, I do want to make another initial point. Uh, this was not developed uh, in their opening brief, as you know, I've already stated that, but to challenge a forum selection clause, you have to actually allege that the forum selection clause itself was not freely negotiated or was the product of unfair bargaining. You can't say the contract as a whole wasn't. It has to be the specific provision, and they've never said that. In fact, they've said the opposite. They've said, and this was in the trial court's summary judgment ruling, that some of the provisions taken by themselves alone may be enforceable, which would include the forum selection clause. But as a whole, the guarantee is not enforceable under their theory. That's fatal to their argument on forum selection clause. And the court doesn't need to go further. But if the court does, freely negotiated does not mean good faith negotiations. There's nothing in case law that says that you have to accept other people's request to change your documents. Freely negotiated under the case law in Arizona and the federal level all focus on two things, fraud or coercion. There's no allegation of any of those things here. Supporting the factors supporting enforcement of a forum selection clause are met in this case. Number one, they're both sophisticated persons. Dr. Bailey is a sophisticated businessman. He testified at length on that, about that. He, um, Mrs. Bailey has a college degree, owned her own business. She's also sophisticated. They both said they read the guarantee. They initialed the page where the forum selection clause was was in, and it was clearly delineated. Um, Dr. Bailey and Mrs. Bailey had, at the time they signed this guarantee, they had a $91 million empire, real estate empire. So this was not akin to the cases that they cite regarding unconscionability, where somebody's going into an emergency room, is not clear, clearly thinking, is under duress, absolutely has to have the surgery right then, and is handed forms has no time to read and they sign it. Those are very different facts than what we have here. We have somebody that was represented by counsel. Judge Motley reviewed the, the guarantee. Judge Bailey, their own son, reviewed the guarantee and commented about how great those loan documents were. There was no comment about, oh, this form selection clause is unfair. Change it. Never was that alleged. In fact, Dr. Bailey praised Yam at the closing and said, thank you for closing this so quickly. You're great to work with. I have 7.7 .7 million reasons to be thankful for Yam. Mr. Curry, at the time that was negotiated, Yam Capital had a presence in Arizona, correct? That's correct. Yes, um, and that goes to the specific jurisdiction argument, for sure. Well, um, what I'm trying to figure out, I mean, if Yam reached an agreement, had a forum selection clause, that selected a forum that was unrelated to where it was present and then later moved or something, that would be quite a different case, I think. But we don't have those facts here. YAM has always had a presence in Arizona, including at the time that the, the guarantee was signed. That's correct. YAM has always been based in Arizona. They are currently based in Arizona. Um, it was started by an, a person who started a prior well-known uh, Arizona business. Um, so it's always been focused on Arizona. I will also note that 
the term sheet that was signed on September 8th, 2017, before the loan documents clearly made, made it clear that Arizona was going to be the forum. It said that the loan documents would be signed in Maricopa County and that it would be governed by Arizona, Maricopa County law. So this was not a surprise that was forced on them. Also did want to note that... Go. Well, I was just going to follow up with um, the, the Baileys make a significant point that they were under some dire circumstances. But is there any case out there that says their dire circumstances result, are, are results in coercion by the lender in, in this kind of situation? Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Your Honor. No, I have not found any cases. I'm not saying that it's not, we have done an exhaustive national search for that fact issue, but no cases were cited by the opposing party, but certainly. In fact, when people are looking to get a loan, it's usually because there's some circumstance that makes them need the money. That, that's correct, and usually there's a there's a time period that they the borrower usually wants to close the loan and by a time period for you know maybe they have a third party sale agreement maybe there's some other time pressure involved, but that doesn't make it coercion. Is is there any case law out there because now I want to get to the statute under conditions requisite to fair sale? Yes. Okay. That the economic conditions which cause property to fluctuate up and down. Um, that says the a change in economic conditions can undermine the conditions requisite to fair sale? Uh, there's no case law that directly in Arizona specifically that directly says this is what that phrase means. But right. the case law has always held that the economic condition is not relevant to whether or not to the date of the sale or the valuation date. The valuation date is mandated by 33 814A, it says it must be as of the sale date, regardless of whether the economic conditions are favorable. That would be an unworkable system. Everyone would object and say, well, this is not as high as 2017, so this isn't a fair sale. It's not as high as 2012. It's not a fair sale. Um, that exists for a reason. It's a hypothetical statement. And in fact, as I pointed out in the in our opening brief, this really comes from the appraisal. Um, this, this definition of fair market value comes from appraisal. Uh, methodology and it and it's it's almost identical to what's under use path for fair for it's called market value not fair market value and use path because you don't subtract for market value you don't subtract liens uh, prior liens but under fair market value you do subtract prior liens and that's the difference really the only difference between them is so, there any case out there that really says what it means the conditions requisite to fair sale Arizona or otherwise, because I struggle with, I don't, under our circumstances, it's just the economic conditions. There was right. a pandemic. Right. Prices were down. Um, but any case out there that suggests what that would mean, when that might be triggered? I, I'm not familiar with any case that has, has directly addressed that issue, but our appraiser did address that issue. And that, that phrase under appraisal methodology means whether or not the sale is fair between two parties, like there's no coercion between them. There's not an insider selling, like a husband selling to his wife or a business partner selling to a business partner for $1. Those would be conditions that would not be a fair sale, that, and that's what that's referring to. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let oh. me ask you a hypothetical, though. Um, it, it seems to me from the definition of fair market value, the one thing that's absolute is the date. It's the date um, as of the date of the execution sale. So that's a, that's a specific date. That's correct. The value, however, doesn't mean the highest bid at the execution sale. It could be higher. It could be lower. It could be substantially higher or substantially lower for some of the reasons that you describe, right? If it was inside baseball, you know, sort of non-publicized sale, um, you'd have an adjustment up. I could envision, I suppose, if I tried hard, uh, a world where the sale price would be higher um, than the fair market value. But am I, am I reading that statute the same way you are? Yes, you are, Your Honor. In fact, I would say you're not taking it far enough because the, what happens at the trustee sale is absolutely irrelevant to the fair market value. So if you have no one bid like you did here at the trustee sale, that's not relevant. That's why we didn't introduce that evidence below. If you have 100 people bid on it and they all outbid each other, that's also not relevant because that's not a fair sale. A trustee sale is a distress sale. By definition, it's a liquidation. And so under the definition, it would never qualify as fair market value. You wouldn't use the trustee sale at all. But that brings up another point that 
even even um, contracts or sales where the parties are disinterested and they negotiate the terms and it's all fair, even those contracts are not always fair market value. But just because one buyer decides to pay something for uh, overpay, then it could not necessarily fair market value, which is the issue that ha happened in this case with the subsequent sales. Because what the statute says is the most probable price among all market participants, not the actual sale price that occurred. In those circumstances, though, the latter hypotheticals you described, that might be relevant in determining the fair market value. It's just not dispositive. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the subsequent, if it's a subsequent you, sale? You, you, yeah. You, you know, it's, it's, again, to use your appraisal hypothetical, if you have the same property is sold the next day, that's instructive, not binding, but instructive about what the property was worth the day before. Potentially, it could be. I, from a legal standpoint, it likely is relevant. From, and, and again, I'm saying relevant, but, right, but not right. dispositive. But from an appraiser standpoint, it may not be relevant because that depends on what the market knew on the date of the right. sale. So let me ask you this, because you said that this contemplates a distress sale, but that's not part of this language anywhere. It is supposed to be a fair market value, right. not for a distressed property, not under distress. So can I, I don't see that it goes that as far as you articulated. And I'm curious, are you trying to ask us to go that far? No, I'm sorry. I must have misstated what I was saying. I was saying a trustee sale is a distress sale, and so right. it's irrelevant to fair market value. Okay. Because fair market value cannot be under duress. Got it. I, mean, I'm not, I misunderstood what you said, and I wanted to make sure I, I got it. I do want to address, uh, I have five minutes left, I do want to address uh, the motion for summary judgment. I think there's a misunderstanding about that, which was the reason for the motion for clarification. But it, looking at the summary judgment motion, I believe counsel said that there was no um, rulings on that uh, or factual findings or something to that effect. I'm not quoting him, but in fact, there were. And if you look on page one of the summary judgment ruling that was issued in on December 27th, uh, 2020, um, it specifically say the co says the court adopts the following operative facts as stated in Yam's motion and about which there are no genuine disputes and then goes through those facts, which establishes all the elements of our claim, including the amount of the indebtedness, less the fair market value. Now the confusing language that was in there was on the was the last paragraph, the last full paragraph, but that has to be read in context. The court was discussing Loop 101 and the and the waiver of that prospective waiver of the fair market value hearing, and the court said, however, to the extent the matter is litigated in Arizona, the court is persuaded that the protection afforded by ARS 33814A apply, and accordingly, accordingly. There is at a minimum a genuine issue of material fact as to the damages that precludes entry summary judgment. So there's that accordingly, and then there's that minimum, right? So we we read it as accordingly that this was really only about the fair market value. That's what was left. They read at minimum to mean that there were all the facts issues. And there was confusing language. I acknowledge that that's not very clear exactly what the judge was saying, what were the issues of fact that were remaining. And so our clarification motion was to ask the trial court, we're not alleging new facts, we're not making new arguments, but tell us what issues are still remaining so we can focus our discovery and the trial on those issues. And that's all we did in our clarification motion. It wasn't a new summary judgment motion. The court went back, looked at its ruling, realized that it was unclear and said, no, the only issue is the fair market value of, of the property. And that was it. And except for that at minimum, Need the, with the need for clarification, the, the, the resulting order was entirely consistent, really. The, correct. We would not say that there was any change in this, on what happened in December and what happened in May when the clarification order came out. That was simply just saying, this is what I meant by my words. And the okay. court has the authority to do that. Excuse me while I'm just checking my notes here, Your Honor, make sure I address everything. I think that that covers everything that I wanted to address. Obviously, there are more issues in this case, but um, if you have any specific questions, I will certainly be willing to answer them. Otherwise, I'll cede my time. Thank you, Mr. Curran. Thank you. 
Mr. Walker, rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. First of all, with respect to the court's ruling on summary judgment, Mr. Curry quoted the language on page one, but if the court looks at page two, he states, according to Yam, the indebtedness due on the note was, and he goes on to give figures. He's not saying there's no issue of dispute. He's saying this is what Yam claims. And the evidence submitted, or there was no evidence submitted that proved by competent evidence what the amount of the damages were. There was just a listing of the supposed damages and a statement from their executive that that list was accurate. No indication of the documents from which those numbers were derived. Mr. Curry refers to this as a typical commercial guarantee. Well, in my experience, and I suspect the court's experience, that's not quite true. This is an incredibly one-sided, oppressive document that strips the Baileys of virtually any right that they could imagine having and arrogates to Yam expansive rights that the law doesn't necessarily provide. Now, with respect to the issue of specific jurisdiction, Mr. Curry has represented to this court, both in his brief and this morning, that there is a burden. And all they have to do is establish a prime facie case of specific, of jurisdiction. And then the burden shifts to the defendant to disprove. Well, that is the case in the context of a motion to dismiss. It's not the case in a Rule 56 motion for summary judgment. And the issue of jurisdiction was squarely presented in both motions. To finally dispose of the jurisdictional issue, there had to be, Yam had to prove that there was no genuine issue of material fact and it was entitled to judgment as a matter of law on the issue of specific jurisdiction. It did not do that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Counsel, we appreciate your briefs. We appreciate your argument this morning. Thank you very much. We'll take this matter under advisement and we'll issue a written ruling in due course. Court stands adjourned.